I refuse to go over there. Larry is my father. He lives across from high school. I live around the corner. There's six of us that live in that neighborhood. Yeah. But there's six of my employees, including me, that live in that two block area where you're in. That's why we call it Ambulance Heights. Yeah. Welcome. Call it this is our third class. We only have 27 more to go. Get in there. Any questions before we get started? Yes. So when you do your live scan, where do you go for that? Ah, that's an excellent question. You go to a place that does live scans. <laughs> so, so, no, you can go to um, Sheriff's Department, local police stations, or if you want to do it for pretty cheap, any UPS store, or um, I don't believe Pages in Central County does it, but uh, UPS store in Reading, and there's another imaging store that does it. Why does the mailbox does it? Why does mailbox does that like skin? Cool. Why does the mailbox is probably your best price. Those are the ones that I recommend. Law enforcement usually is a little more because it's government, they're a little far more pricey. You got to make an appointment. Why does the mailbox, you probably can just walk in, right? Yeah, just walk in and get live skin. You're thinking way ahead. I like it. Yeah, you're gonna need two of them, right? Yeah. You gotta pay for it twice. Why? It's bureaucracy. That's how government works. So, right, that's not how live scan works. So you gotta pay for the live scan goes to the agency linked to that live scan. So like to get your EMT, you have to have a link to California State EMS Authority. Okay, so that way, if you get arrested, they notify California State EMS alert that you got arrested, so they can revoke your license. So then, to get your ambulance driver's license, it's got to be linked to California DMV. Even though they're both state agencies, they're separate state agencies. You have to pay for a separate link to go to DMV. So then when you get arrested, then they take away your EMT license and your ambulance driver's license. So what it does is, for every live scan you have on file, when you get in trouble and you get scanned again, it automatically notifies whoever has a link on file. So that's why you have to pay for separate ones. Before exam two, it's on your first day handout. <laughs> I don't have these dates memorized. I go one day at a time. All right, you guys ready to start? So you can't pass the test. The test is going to be on Monday. After you get your picture taken, make sure you brush your hair, wear a nice shirt. On Monday, you get your picture taken and get incised for your shirts. Actually, you just tell them the size. I'm not going to size you. And then uh, you'll get a nice little badge and you know, t-shirts. And I'll wear the best shirt. Anyway, first test is on Monday. But if you don't understand medical terminology and how words work, you're not going to pass the test. You don't know what words are. Make sense? We're going to teach you about medical terminology. Big, long medical words look really complicated, confusing, and intimidating, but they're not because they're like any other big bully. If you break it down into small pieces, they're easy. But we always start off with thought for the day. Safety is always going to come first. If the scene's not safe, you become injured. At minimum, you just double the number of patients on scene. You double the problem. You're there to solve the problem, not double the problem. Safety has to be first. Any questions? That was your thought for the day, brought to you by Brian. All right, so we're going to go over understanding the purpose of medical terminology. You know, the four components of a medical word. You can break it down into four separate pieces to understand what it means. And we're going to go over the directional terms and basic medical terms for anatomy. Any questions? All right, anatomy of a medical term. You have a root that is the foundation. Think of just like a plant or a tree, the roots, the foundation of it is. Then you have a prefix that comes before the root, and then the suffix comes after the root. And then, as Dan will tell you, you have to have combining vowels, plus you probably don't even know who that is anymore. Wheel of Fortune.
It was a game show. Any questions so far? We're going to give you some good examples here. All right, so here's an example. So some root words you have to know. Cardi means heart. Kepa means liver. Nephra means kidneys. And thoracic means chest. You have to know those root words. If you understand those root words, you got over half of this down. Memorize that. Know it, live it, learn it. Learn it, live it. All right, prefix. Hyper means above, fast. Too much. Hypo means not enough or under or below. Tacky means fast. Grady means slow. So somebody has tacky cardio, what would that mean? Rapid heart, heart rate. They have Brady cardio, what would that mean? Oh, See how easy that is? Brady cardio, tack cardio, great big words. You break them down, now it's not that big of a deal, right? Now, suffixes, this comes after the root word. So, ectomy means you cut it out. Surgical removal. Itis is an inflammation. So, what would hepatitis mean? Yep, liver inflammation. Oma is a tumor. Pathy is a disease. So, cardiopathy would be what? Heart disease. See how easy medical terminology is? Just kind of break it into little pieces. Any questions? Anybody ever seen the television series Dexter? Yeah. That's how that's how he took care of bullets. Broke them down into little pieces. <laughs> Solve the problem. All right, directional terms. Superior means above. So, like your chest is superior to your belly back, your jaw is superior to your knee. Inferior means below. Your knees are inferior to your elbows. Right means the patient's right. Left means the patient's left. So I can look down the whole list. So I can call them a break time. Yeah, we're back to five because now I didn't see him turn the fuck out. So, okay, I will let you know about eight o'clock. I'll call him. Okay, no problem. Bye. Sorry about that. It's my boss. All right, lateral and medial. Lateral is away from the midline of the body. So the midline is, well, you can see it right there. You cut the guy right in half. 
So laterals away from the midline, medials towards the midline. Proximal and distal. Proximal is towards the trunk of the body. Distal is away. So your wrist is distal to your elbow. Your shoulder is proximal to your elbow. Superficial and deep is about penetration. Superficial is when it just barely breaks the skin. Deep is when it goes well into your body. Any questions? Yes. So on the like quizzes, I was kind of confused about proximal distal, like on the elbow. Uh huh. The elbow, like, is technically like I guess, was the breaks like humerus? Yeah, so that would be proximal to the proximal elbow. Proximal to the elbow. But distal to the shoulder. Distal to the shoulder. Okay. Yeah, distal goes away from the trunk. Proximal is okay. towards the trunk. Okay. Okay, so it's all just relative to the trunk, not to where the break is. Correct. Gotcha. Okay. And if it's on the trunk, then you go medial and lateral from the big midline. Gotcha. Okay. Any questions? Like if it's broken. Not right. Broken. So like if it's all the way on the side, it'd be lateral. Okay. Did you specify the side on that too? Yes. Okay. Yes. Or like if they're even lying on their side. Be like right lateral recovery. They're lying on the right side. Lying on the left side, left lateral recovery. All right, directional terms. Ventral is the belly side. Dorsal is the back side. Think of the dorsal fin as a shark. The shark's going around, the dorsal fin's on the back. When I was a kid, I always wanted to motorize the dorsal fin sub so I could take out the lake system. Mm -hmm. Freshwater sharks, nothing more terrifying. Anterior or posterior? Anterior is the front of your body, posterior is the back of your body. Any questions? Is there a reason why you would choose one or the other, or is it interchangeable? As in what? Like as in, if you were to describe somebody's like a cut to the back of somebody, would it be like posterior? Or like... Usually, would go um posterior. Okay. I wonder if I should answer that. Everybody knows I'm an EMT class. Is Brent? David. Oh, hey, everything's working great. Yeah. I am in the classroom. Everything appears to be running great. We have printers, we have a projector. Um, everything looks good. It is. Yeah, everything. Yeah, Zoom's on, it's recording, everything's good. Yeah, no, you guys did great. Well, hey, thank you, sir. Bye. So it's COS Tech, they took all the power down. They said to make sure all the systems rebooted. <laughs> had to test the new generator. All right. So anyway, the question was, when would you use anterior versus posterior? So generally, if someone's upright, you go anterior or posterior. Whereas in things like um, the top of your foot's the dorsal foot. <laughs> And the body, actually, no, that's not true either, because that's palmar and planter. The bottom of your foot, you consider planters. And the bottom of your hand, you consider palmar, like palms. Um, no one uses ventral and dorsal below. Oh, okay. But I guess, yeah. I guess I don't have a good answer. Sorry. <laughs> All right, palmar is palm of your hand, planter is the bottom of your feet. Flexation is to flex, extension is to extend. Adduction is adding to your body, so it's moving towards the body. Abduction is moving away from the middle. Any questions? Oh, 
the questions on directional terms, huh? So, adduction and abduction. Adduction is when you're moving towards the midline. It's not necessarily a flexation if you're moving towards it. There's an abduction to move away. There's in flexations like this and extensions like this. So, then that's more like uh, seizure activities, the core of the posture, and seizures is going towards the core versus the cervix. Like I got some good videos I'll share around. Or, like, abduction, like, when would you apply it? Uh, abduction is like if you're on, like if someone's altered has like GCS, but they're moving towards the purposeful movement. So you could say they're having abduction if that you move their arms away, they'll still add abduction. Is that a better better picture than me? So abduction is adding. I always I always consider it adding to the body because it's coming towards the body. Person abduction goes away. I used to tell students that abduction is putting it on their stomach to be out to confuse people and then I got in trouble. So it wasn't that funny to begin with. All right, anatomic positions prone is face down. She's technically not prone, prone is face down. Supine is face up. Lying on your right side is right lateral recumbent. Lying on your left side, left lateral recumbent. Fowler's is the sitting up. High Fowler's is almost 90 degrees. Semi Fowler's is 45 degrees. Low Fowler's is below 45 degrees. What was low an elderly person in a uh, one of those sleep attic beds. I'm just get up. <laughs> Where their head's just raised up by a couple of pillows. Not sleep attic. I have one. What are they called? Uh, sleep number. Sleep number. Thank you. Okay. They just elevate their head a little bit. They just slight elevation of the head. It's, it's low dollars. Okay. Semi dollars is what people usually are on the gurney because that's the average position, like 45 degrees. That's the most comfortable. Kind of a refiner position, like when you're watching the game. Yeah. What would be the circumstance for like being thrown on a gurney? Never. That's what <laughs> <Yeah>. Never. <laughs> Unless you're that chick of that guy in that video. Right. <laughs> no, usually what you use associate prone, you find people prone a lot. <laughs> you know, patient was found prone on the kitchen floor, then you immediately roll them over and assess their airway. But no, you should it. never <laughs> transport anyone prone ever. There's okay. never a reason to do that. It doesn't seem very cool. Yeah. Sometimes you'll do what's called a recovery or a coma position, which is left lateral recumbent. If they're vomiting, so you can keep their airway clear, use gravity. Because mm -hmm. you don't want someone's vomiting being so fine because they'll choke on their puke right. and inhale it. Don't want that. <laughs> All right, shock position is supine with the foot's elevated. And then Trendelenburg is when the head's down and the feet's up, which is different than shock. Trendelenburg? Yeah. Where you put the head at the lowest position so all the blood runs to the head. Like in the severe shock situations. Or if you want to put an IV in their neck. It's the jugular veins of gorge. It's going to chit chit for the needle right in Because you can't find an eight hour site to put it. So you run all the blood to one spot of the body. Kind of like blood dependent validity, but you're forcing it. No, you don't do it very often. Only for extreme emergencies. Okay. Yeah, yeah. really dehydrated people. Well, we're going through medical terminology. It's very exciting. I'm having trouble just keeping everybody to calm down. <laughs> yes. So if you find somebody in the supine for a chronic condition, like in the family of sin, then you like direct somebody to marry them. Absolutely. As a unit. 
Yep. That way you can assess their airway. Hard to assess an airway on a prone person. Yeah. And actually, what I try to do, if it's me that's marrying the head, I marry the head like this. So that way, when we roll them over, my hands are already in the right position. So know your abbreviations and your symbols. Any questions? If you know your symbols, you should also know your snare and base throws too. Oh, being serious? Did you write it down? Yeah. All right, time to learn about the human body. Good news is everybody has them. All right, thoughts for the day. Looks like I got a little wordy. Understanding the past is critically important to make the best choices and how and where to move forward. Very true. Understanding the past is important, but living in the past prevents you from growing and moving forward. So never stay in the past. Learn from it. Move forward. Use the building blocks for the future. If you're human, pretty much everybody in this room is. Do you know you have enough for them? I have never known until 8 o'clock. But if you're around, that's awesome. If you got things to do, I fully understand too. I, I bet you do. It's not like you got to work in the morning or anything. <laughs> there are mistakes and bad choices if you're human you're going to make those but it's not the mistake or the bad choice that ruins you it's what you do after you make a mistake or a bad choice is what makes or breaks you any questions all right skeletal system one of the most popular things at Halloween gives the body form, protects your organs. And most people, it's 206 bones. That's the framework so you can have motion. Any questions about the skeleton? No questions about skeletons, huh? Yes. Well, we have to memorize all of the bones. Yeah, the, the first exam we'll have on Monday will have questions on all 206. There'll be arrows pointing to them. You've got to choose which one of the 206 is the right one. Okay. And Pretty cool. Ways. It's interactive. It's why we do it on the computer. So you hold up a bone and. No, no, it's on the computer screen. Uh, yes. I would never joke about the test. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm joking. <laughs> I need to generally know the thing about us. You didn't know the humorous, the beamers, the oldest, the radials, Tim Fid, exactly. Okay. Correct. Yeah, that's on exam two. Exam one is one through five. Are we supposed to reach out to see? No, five. Okay. We're getting ahead. That's okay that we're getting good ahead because we've got some really big chapters that I'm going to talk a lot about. And it's going to throw us right back behind. So you're okay. And the practice quiz. Practice quiz should have been one through five before tonight, not six. Six is until Monday. It may be seven. I got to look. You can absolutely work ahead. I recommend, actually, I recommend the question was for those of you that are listening and not talking. Um, the question was, can you work ahead? Absolutely, because there's good times in this class gets really hard. You have other things in life that gives you cushion of safety. Literally. All right. The skull. Now, without kidding, not joking around, I will expect you to know the names of every vertebrae on the spine. And I'm going to teach you because every vertebrae on your spine has its own unique individual name. And you will learn them by the end of tonight. 
I've got a trick that's easy to teach you how to do this. Now, the first one's Sam, second one's George, third one's Karen. But anyway, I got a way of teaching on how to learn them. It's really smart. So that's a cadaver cutting half of the band's off. But it shows you it is. <laughs> but it shows you a pretty good thing with the anatomy. The nasal pharynx, the oropharynx, that's the tongue, that's the epiglottis. There's your brain stem, your medulla obligata, and your uh, cervical spine. And of course, that's your cerebrum, your cerebellum. Any questions? Yeah. Eat lots of bacon. Situations like that where it's lots of yeah, like a Nobody's got that muscle. That's how you do Hershel Walker was. Questions? Or are you just scratching the back of your neck? You're palpating your neck. All right, things you need to know on the neck. You need to know where the uh, carotid arteries are. You need to know about those jugular veins. The cricoid cartilage, that'll be on tests. So if you feel right below the Adam's apple, there's like a diamond shaped cartilage. There's really hard soft spot in the center of it, that diamond. So the cartilage, the hard diamond thing there, that's your cricoid cartilage. The soft spot in the center there, that's your cricoid membrane. And there will be test questions about the selic maneuver. That's uh, when you do, you take the, the cricoid cartilage, you push in, it'll collapse the esophagus. So if you're using the back valve mass, the air doesn't go into the stomach, down the esophagus, it goes into the airway, the lungs. All right. I don't think most states they let you do the selic maneuvers. <laughs> Also, incompetent paramedics will ask you to do that so they don't innovate the esophagus. All right. You're going to learn the names of every vertebrae. Yes. All right. So, cervical. You got seven cervical vertebrae. The first one's name is C1. The next one's name is C2. Oh. The third one's name is C3. <laughs> it goes all the way down to C7. You got like a bony protrusion there right at C7, T1. And then the thoracic, the highest thoracic one, the most superior is T1. The one right below it, T2, T2. And it goes all the way down to T12. You're going to know every vertebrae's name by the end of the night. I promise you that, and I'm not. Am I right? I guess. The lumbar, five vertebrae. L1, L2, L3, L4, L5. Your sacrum's got four, and your coccyx only has one. And it's not C1, C1's up there. Just the scale though. It's the only one that's got a name. Yeah. But they're all Ps, so don't be able to get that. You can't probably get that. Yeah, 7125 was the one to beat the over test. Pretty much protected with going down here. Yeah, so the, the seven cervical vertebrae and the five lumbars get damaged the most because they have the most range of motion. Whereas then the 12 thoracic are attached to your 12 posterior ribs. So they don't have the same range of motion. So it, you can break your thoracic vertebrae, but it's hard. You gotta work, you gotta work really good at it. Serious, serious blunt force trauma to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh four, but they're all fused together, so it doesn't really count. It's like one. Mm -hmm. It's like it Siamese twins that are there's four of them together. They're all fused. Is it, is it be like a test question? Yeah. I don't think there's any sacred test questions. They're only worried about cervical thoracic and lumbar. Those are the ones that are really bad when you break them. Any questions about the spinal column and their vertebrae? Seven, twelve, five. Yes. <coughs> Invertebrate animals never get spinal injuries. Fun fact.
There's an actual C's one through seven, but it looks like in real life they cut it in half. What was it cut with? Bandsaw. I don't know. <laughs> I was making a joke that it was a bandsaw. It could have been a skull saw. But it does show you, though, how small the spinal canal is. So if you crush or break a vertebrae and the spinal cord starts swelling, there's really not a room for it to swell. That's how you end up being paralyzed. It swells and cuts the blood flow off the spinal cord. And then, yeah, nothing below that injury works. So that's why cervical fractures and trauma are, even though we don't see spine like we used to, cervical trauma is still a very, very big deal. So the main problem is it swells up and it's got no room. Yep, and, and it shuts the blood flow off. Then the tissue dies, the nervous system dies. And you then, break the cervical cord. Oh, the cord? Yeah, yeah you got some cut. So what will happen is in severe mechanism of injury or blood flow trauma, Disease, if the vertebrae snap and they're sharp, they can actually cut the cord. And yeah, there, there is, you can't completely sever the cord. That usually ends up, in, if it's in the cervical, that usually ends up in the apical. Lumbar, not so much. But cervical, it usually ends up, unless there's something right there. You have Christopher Rebus, Superman, the, the original Superman. Yeah, he broke C2. It shut off you, it shuts off all your breathing ability and everything. So, fortunately, there was an EMS team right there, sort of bagging them immediately. Yeah, he, got a, he was doing an equestrian horse and got bucked off and broke C2 and severed his spinal cord. So, he never, huh? Never going on the horse again. Yeah. So, the trivia question though is what was the horse's name? Kryptonite. No, Kryptonite. No. I did seriously. No, <laughs> 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 you think an actor that plays Superman would ride a horse named Kryptonite and be suicide? <laughs> <laughs> it almost was. Maybe he just wanted to feel like Superman. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying. It's always a work in progress. Maybe when I get older. There's a MRI of what the spinal column looks like. Looks like he's got scoliosis. All right, there's your 12 vertebrae with the 12 posterior ribs attached to it. And then you all see the anterior version of the rib cage. Any questions? No questions, huh? All right, the abdomen. Yes, you do need to know all of the organs in the abdomen. And which ones are solid and which ones are hollow. And which quadrant they're in. So if you make a cross right across the abdomen, right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, left lower quadrant. Large intestines in all four quadrants. Small intestines in all four quadrants. Then after that, it gets pretty secular. And the quadrant yeah. say yeah. something else. It goes off of their left and right. Off their left and right, correct. Kind of like stage and theater. It's the actor's right and the actor's left. Or no, it, yeah. Or no. I don't remember house anyone. Never, I didn't say that. Huh? House and stage. Yeah, house and stage. But I forget which is which. Oh, well. Good thing I don't act. Liver takes up most of your right quadrant, uh, right upper quadrant. You have to know which organs are each quadrant. Oh. And for mechanism injuries, like you have the you know, right upper quadrant vein, you got to be liver fracture, gallbladder. <laughs> Any questions on the abdomen and its We're organs? On the with the, uh, the ribs. What's that? We're on that photo with the ribs. On this photo? Yes. So the ribs should end right about here. There's a, so this right here is a diaphragm. Mm -hmm. Depending on where you're breathing, depends on where these organs are. So when you're inhaling, the organs get smashed down. And when you're exhaling, they go up. So yeah, so that's why when someone gets shot or stabbed in the chest, you never really know if you got the advent of blunt because of what breath where they order the breath with their feet. 
You're getting shocked to the inhale and exhale first. Depends. You want to get let them get your liver or your lung. Mm -hmm. I'd rather I guess my the lung probably didn't get to get through. Yeah, I don't know. The lung can get faster. You get tension pneumo. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, that's a hard one. Any questions about the uh, four quadrants? The costal arch. I don't even worry about that. I need to take that out. So, the pelvis. The pelvis fractures are life threatening injuries. And the reason why is the biggest artery in your body is the aorta, right? The biggest vein is the vena cava. So both the aorta, the descending aorta, and the inferior vena cava both bifurcate inside the pelvis. The uh, iliac crest is one of the strongest bones in the body, but when it breaks, sharp, jagged bone. And if it cuts your femoral artery, or your femoral vein, or your vena cava, or your aorta, it's a life-threatening bleed. So pelvis, fractured pelvises, you can bleed to death quickly. It's a true emergency. Quickly. Like in under five minutes, it completely severs it. Bind the pelvis. Pelvic binder, not California. In California, what you do is you put a pillow between their legs, drag them onto a backboard. Don't roll them, drag them. And then use your spider straps to bind the pelvis together. Can you drag them by the shoulder? Yeah, long axis drag. We'll teach you how to do it. Don't ever roll. Someone's got hip pain or pelvic pain on one side, never roll them onto the affected side. Big no no. It can be fatal. So, what your hip is, is actually your proximal femur. It's the top of your femur that goes into the pelvis. That's the joint, the hip's a joint. So generally, if you break a hip or dislocate a hip or the hip's deteriorating, it's the head of the proximal femur is bad and it's falling out of the joint, out of the pelvis, that is. No. Any questions? So here's a seat. I'm just had to wait for the next slide. So <laughs> So your hip is the proximal femur. It's the head of the femur where it goes to the pelvis. Usually when someone breaks a hip, they break the pro they actually don't even call them hip fracture. That'll preserve the proximal femur fracture. And it breaks off right there. And that's the weakest point. That's usually where you break a hip. So your femur is just free floating in the legs, which can tear tissue and arteries. Unlikely it's going to tear your femoral, but it could. So that's why hip fractures are also potentially life threatening. And then the ball or the head of the, of the femur is still inside your pelvis. Yeah. And then when you get a deteriorating hip, that's when the head of the, the ball, the top of the proximal femur, is deteriorated off from arthritis and it just pops out and dislocates. So that's why they go and they do like when they do a hip prosthesis, is they just cut the top of the femur off. Then they put in a prosthesis, they glue it on the top of the femur and pop it back into the pelvis. Yeah, Paul, Paul comes here. He's got two. He's got two fake hips, both sides. No, it's the proximal femur. So the hip is a ball joint. The knee is a hinge joint. So you can go 360 degrees with your leg. With your hip, you can go 360 degrees, whereas your knee only goes forward and backwards. Unless you're a fullback that takes a lateral impact. I'm just kidding. Not cool. So you need to know the difference between the tibia and the fibula. The tibia is the bone in the front that goes from the knee down to the ankle. The fibula is the little tiny bone in the back that's bedded into your calf. Any questions? What do you think is worse for <laughs> mm, usually they break together. It's the force that breaks the tibia usually breaks the fibula and it breaks on the opposite end. So like if you break your tibia up here, it'll break the tibia down here. It's just the way the force breaks things from blood force trauma. Or if you break your uh, tibia down here, which is common right above the ankle, usually the fibula breaks up by the knee. But usually the fibula will heal on its own. Sometimes the tibia they gotta go in the tent, depending on how badly you broke it. My daughter broke 
her tibia 18 places. Spiral fracture, tibia fracture. It was pretty cool because what the surgeon did is he went in with hammer nails and he went in and wrapped it internally with hammer nails and ten, six inches for the entire surgery. She had 10% weight there the next day. Pretty impressive. And they just let the fibula high heal on its own. The fibula broke in like three places. Yeah. So, kind of random. Shin splints? Is that the fibula like hairline fracturing or is that like the muscle? No, shin splints is on your, is on your tibia. And then it's an inflammation oh. of the proximal tibia, if I understand it correctly. So it's the inflammation of the, of the tendons and the ligaments where it goes into your uh, proximal tibia. It just is a constant movement. Sure, I'd have to look it up. I know it's very painful from lots of impact, but usually it's an inflammation. That's why NSAID is the best. Don't just relieve it. Any questions? All right, upper extremities. So again, your shoulder is where the humerus goes into the clavicle and the uh, scapula. It's a ball joint, and then your elbow is a hinge joint. That's where your humerus goes to the radial and the ulna. Radial is on the side of the thumb, ulna is on the side of the pinky. These bones you need to know. That's why I got them out. The other 200, yeah. Well, the verb ratio. Huh? Yeah, it's all in the book. Page 92. I'm just kidding. I have no idea what page it is. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. And the shoulder girdle is like the combination of the like joints. Yeah, the joints so the, the clavicle, the lateral clavicle, and the back of the scapula come in. They call it the AC joint. Okay. And I don't know why. And anterior clavicular joint. And that's where then your humerus goes into that joint. That's what makes the shoulder joint or not. Goes into the where the clavicle comes in and the scapula. And the shoulder goes in there. And that's what makes that shoulder joint. Not the shoulder. Got it. I'm screwing up my words. It's Humorous it's goes in to make the shoulder. Okay. Ooh, so that's all. It's a combo, though. Right. See how the clavicle and the scapula are on there? Yeah. And then the humerus goes into that, makes your shoulder joint. Got you. Okay. Hinge joints versus ball joints. Any questions? Shoulders and hips are, are ball joints, knees and elbows, hinge joints. Sit with your fingers and toes, hinge joints. The angle and wrist, like I, they're not really ball joints because that's just cartilage. They're not really yeah. the same things as joints. Uh -huh. I mean, they are joints, but not like a not like a ball joint thing because it's free cartilage and tendons is what it is. That's why angles and wrists are a little more complicated. So, why do we need a muscle skeletal system? It gives us shape, protects our organs. Gives us movement with our 600 muscles. Any questions? This is not anatomy and physiology. You do not have to name them. One muscle, you definitely need to know the diaphragm. Definitely need to know that one. So, Skeletal muscles are voluntary. So when your brain tells them to move, they'll move. Smooth muscles are involuntary, like your esophagus and your intestines and your uh, arteries. They do things on autopilot. You don't have to think about it. There's one muscle, though, that is voluntary and involuntary. That's both properties. So there's one muscle in your body. No, damn it. So you breathe normally without having to think about it 12 to 20 times a minute, every minute of the day. But if you need to take a deep breath or you need to blow out candles, you can raise or lower your diet. <laughs> what about what? Plankton? Plankton? Yeah, I do automatically. I don't know if that's muscles. Though. It's like it's got to be muscles, isn't it? What muscles are those? The yeah, eyelid muscle? Ocular something. Mm, you may have me on that one. 
I think the test is going to tell you, though, that the answer on the test is not the eyelids, it's going to be the diaphragm. <laughs> I think I just want the class, so. Yeah, you, you got me on that one. Now, your cardiac muscle is different than smooth and skeletal. It's its own unique type of muscle. It is an involuntary, like a smooth muscle, but it has its own blood supply, and it generates and has its own electrical supply, too, which is what keeps the heart in synchronization, which is really cool. And we'll go over that in uh, cardiac emergencies after midterm. There's a lot to learn about that. All right, respiratory system. So it starts with the oral and nasal pharynx. It goes down through your upper glottis, and your glottis, and your trachea, down to your bronchioles, which then break off your bronchioli. Which then go down to these little things called alveoli, where the gas exchange takes place. So, how you breathe is very important. You have to know that for the test. The mechanics of breathing is what you do is, is you contract your intercostal muscles in your diaphragm, and that creates a space inside your thorax. And that space has less than atmospheric pressure. So, atmospheric air rushes in. Then when you relax your intercostal muscles, you relax your diaphragm, it creates greater than atmospheric pressure the air rushes back out. That's why it's easier to breathe at sea level than it is in Mount Shasta or weed, because there's more atmospheric pressure at sea level. The more atmospheric pressure you have, it's easier to breathe. Any questions? So atmospheric pressure is the pressure of air on the earth, on the planet. There's an amount of pressure on the planet, the air pressure. So the sea level is at 14.7 pounds. And for every thousand feet of elevation, it is half a pound. So up here, we've lost around 3,500 feet. So we've lost like two pounds of pressure. So it's like 12.7 here. So you don't have as much air pressure to inhale than you do at sea level. And you go to the top of Mount Shasta, then you really got to suck air down, try to get air in. Mm, kind of, it's different. It is that's also atmospheric pressure, but not the same as respiratory. But it is like why, like a lot of athletes go to Flagstaff, Arizona to train because it's at seven thousand foot elevation. So you lose a half pound for some of those, those three and a half pounds less. So it's like eleven point two or ten point nine. So then they, when they train in Flagstaff and they go back down to sea level, then they can run like wild. Wow. That makes sense. Any questions? So we already went over that. So the diaphragm, you need to know the diaphragm. Dome-shaped muscle separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity, contracts during inhalation, relaxes during exhalation. No questions? I taught you how to breathe right. There's the inhalation process we talked about. It creates so when you yes yeah, so your thoracic what happens is when you contract the diaphragm and your costal muscles it creates makes your your thorax bigger so that creates less than atmospheric pressure in space so the atmospheric air runs until it equalizes then when you relax your diaphragm and your costal muscles it creates greater than atmospheric pressure and the air rushes back out and equalizes that's how breathing works. What do you mean muscles space out the diaphragm? Diaphragm is one muscle. One big dome shaped muscle. Any questions? Any questions about exhalation? So, when you inhale air, you bring oxygen in, oxygen goes down to the alveoli. The alveoli are so tiny. Only one red blood cell at a time can go through. If it does, 
it exchanges the carbon dioxide atom for an oxygen atom. So that's how you breathe out carbon dioxide when you inhale oxygen. What's that? I know that name, but I can't place it. The one where the, it's the like animated movie where Bill Murray gets sick from taking soup from a monkey and then his, he gets a fever and the cells in his body are like. I don't believe I've seen the entire movie. I think I've seen parts of it. I'll have to go check that out. No, yeah, there's a part where um, you can see some of the magic exchanging stuff. Yeah, that's cool. Very cool. All right, so there is a great animation of that, of the oxygen going in and being exchanged for carbon dioxide. So you are expected to know that. You're expected to know the parts of the airway I'm going down to the bronchioles, the bronchiolis, the alveolis. You also need to know the blood pathway through the heart and through the body. Okay. Any questions? So yes. I'm looking at the pictures, the blue would represent the um... deoxygenated blood, and red is oxygenated blood. Oh. Blue is full of carbon dioxide, and red is full of oxygen. And it's that way in real life, actually. Next question. So when we're breathing in air, like does the where does the other components of air go if we're just taking one oxygen? Nitrogen? Yeah. It goes back out. And actually you exhale. So you inhale, I believe, I can't remember, hmm. 16 or 18 percent is what the oxygen in the atmosphere is with nitrogen. Right. And when you exhale, you exhale like 12 percent. Because you only use like two or three percent of it. That's why mouth to mouth resuscitation works because you're still breathing, you're exhaling enough oxygen. enough oxygen to give to someone else. Okay. That is my beaver. Somebody else. So. Your diaphragm, your intercostal muscles contracting and relaxing to breathe is all regulated in your medulla obligata, which is your brain stem. And it runs off the system when the carbon dioxide level in your blood gets too high. The medulla obligata says breathe, and it triggers a respiratory response. Now, if you're a smoker and you have emphysema or another type of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, the carbon dioxide level will always be high because you retain carbon dioxide. So then it goes to a backup system, which is hypoxia. Hypoxia means low oxygen levels. You have to know that for the test. There'll be lots of hypoxia questions. It's low oxygen. And when they get low oxygen, then that stabilizes in the brain. That's the backup system. And it's important to you know as an EMT because if you have someone that retains carbon dioxide and you put them on oxygen for too long, like 24 hours, I don't know where in EMS you'd have them for 24 hours. Usually it's from the hospital. But if you wipe out that hypoxic drive and they stop breathing, <laughs> then what do you do? You still don't do it when someone stops breathing. Check the airway. Yeah. Yeah. You only do CPR if you lose the pulse too, which will happen if you don't start BBM. What? It's when the carbon dioxide levels are always high consistently, so the carbon dioxide drive doesn't work anymore. Right. So it goes off low oxygen levels in the blood. When the blood gets low enough high oxygen level of hypoxia, it'll trigger the breath. All right. So why would a BBM work in that situation? Because you're forcing air in. So them, they're not breathing on their own. Oh, okay. So you're so instead of because you breathe off a negative pressure, mm -hmm. so BVM you use positive pressure to breathe for them. So they're sliding off and they're like exactly. Back. They're not cutting it. Right. Like, Loser, you need to breathe more. I'm gonna have to breathe for you. Just kidding. I did not just call people not breathing. <laughs> Do not repeat that. <laughs> I just recorded myself saying that too. Oh my god. <laughs>
That is not how I meant that to work. <laughs> not what I was saying. So, <laughs> I can't believe that she's not. Normal characteristics of breathing, normal rate and depth, regular rhythm. Everybody in this room, look at each other. You guys are all breathing normally. That's what it should look like. Now, if they're labor breathing and they can only take one to two words or three words before they have to take a breath again, that's labored or inadequate breathing. Or if they're turning blue. What's considered normal total Basically, some people as low as 10 depends on what physical condition they're in. You know, you know, fat guy like me, it's probably about 18 is my normal. But a good, healthy, athletic young person might be as low as 10 or 9. That's normal. Any questions? And there's the answer to your question. It's almost like you foresaw it. You've been taking that ESP class in the daytime here, haven't you? If I can tell, it's paying off. I didn't sit on the right. Like kids. So the question was, why is it different for kids and infants as adults? Because kids can breathe faster because they have lower volume. Their chests are smaller, so they have to breathe faster to get the same amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Is. Plus, their metabolisms are so much better than adults. So they're exchanging gas for because they have a much higher metabolism. Yes. So the heart rate that you're seeing, like when there's those healthy heart rates or like any dangerous heart rate, it goes down with age, right? Where like your brain. Yeah, once you're an adult, it's 60 to 100. Okay. When you're yeah. a kid, it's say it's average to be over 100. But I mean, like if you're exerting yourself and you're at like 140 as like a 20 year old, it, that shouldn't be your max. No, 40 year old. Okay. You should be okay. And your heart just can't like recover as quickly. Is that right? No, it's just okay. because so when you're when you're working real hard, that yeah. fight or flight, mm -hmm. you have to increase your heart rate to get the glucose and the oxygen and the carbon dioxide out. So with the kids though, like so their their uh, volume is less and their metabolism is higher, so it's just naturally higher. They have to be faster. That's what they do. Or you get bigger and your and you grow and your metabolism slows, you don't have to have a high heart rate unless you go into fight or flight mode. That's one of the terrifying things about kids is is they don't have the same shock signs and symptoms that adults do because they're already going that fast to have those things. So I think you're really telling kids, which will be a test in the future, is calculator refill time, which they abbreviate CRT. So it's over two seconds. What calculator refill is when you push underneath the veil bed, it turns white. And then when you let go, it'll turn pink again. Mm -hmm. And if that takes more than two seconds in a kid, they are in serious shock. Mm -hmm. So that's the only way you can really tell them kids because they're already tachycardic and they're already breathing faster. Mm -hmm. Because their blood, because they're low on blood volume and their blood shunting to the important organs, so it's not in the fingertips. Yep. Great questions. This seems like because if they're healthier, they would have lower exertion point or something. Right? But it makes sense. Well, kids though, they yeah, because they're smaller. And they're, their anatomy and their physiology is different. We're going to go over that, especially their airways and their cardiac. Kids' systemic vascular resistance is just amazing. I'd love to have that again. Is that a part of the No, it's when we get to pediatrics, is when we'll go over that. That whole human growth rate chapter is just a waste of time. I didn't just say waste of time. Is, um, we'll go through it quickly. I don't have a lot to say about it. Human development is what it's called. They make me teach it. So, how do you know when someone's not breathing adequately? You should be able to recognize this from the doorway as an EMT if they're labored. And you can actually see muscles in their neck and clavicles retracting so they can try to get as much air as possible, the most amount of volume into their chest as possible. If they're turning blue and pale and the respiratory rate's elevated, yes. Will you be showing us like pictures and videos of this? Hopefully. Yeah. It's a it's a constant challenge. That's what I was doing while you guys were doing skills on Tuesday night. 
just going through all the broken links from YouTube removes my videos because they're not appropriate. For some reason, they have something about watching people die. I don't know what it is. I don't want the general public saying, so I throw it up and they got to go find it again. <laughs> it's a constant battle. So here's a basic, now we'll go over this in more detail in pediatrics, but there's a huge difference between the anatomy of children versus the anatomy of adults. And one of the things is, is kids have giant bobbleheads. Um, have you ever seen Peanuts or Charlie Brown? The actual, that, the drawing, Charles Souls got it through that, was actually correct. They have giant heads and little bodies. And that's what kids have. And, um, but when they go unconscious, they also have little tiny, weak, narrow anterior airways. They don't have a lot of developed curtilage. So that's why kids also can't cough stuff up when they get pneumonia and stuff. It's terrifying to be a kid and have that apathy. But when you also, in your head, when you're lying supine, the natural thing is it shuts off the airway. It pinches their weak little airways off. That's why you never want to have a kid lying supine unconscious. You always want to pattern it their shoulders so it levels out that airway. Any questions? You want to, if they're going to be supine, you want to put some padding underneath their shoulders to elevate their shoulders. I think I got a picture. I don't. Yeah, but if you if they're not breathing adequately, you got to hold their airway open. You need to get their thorax up so that the airway is level. Otherwise, their heads are so big it moves their airway forward. Unlike an adult. No, I never lay a kid flat. Keep them in an upright sitting position. <laughs> Sleeping, I always keep them up. Nothing more terrifying than kids with respiratory so Scares the hell out of me. Any questions? All right. You got to know the blood flow. So you're a little red blood cell that's left a cell. You delivered the oxygen to the cell. You've taken the carbon dioxide and lactic acid. Now you have to get rid of it. So you're going to go back through the venous system to either the inferior or the superior vena cava. So the inferior vena cava is below the heart. That's why it's the inferior vena cava. The superior vena cava is above the heart. So the blood goes from the two vena cavas. They meet together at the right atrium. Blood goes in the right atrium. That's where it first starts getting to the heart. That's deoxygenated blood coming from the venous system. Goes into the right atrium, then it goes through the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle. Then from the right ventricle, it'll go through the pulmonary valve to the pulmonary artery. There will be test questions about the pulmonary artery. Arteries always take blood away from the heart. Veins always drink wing blood to the heart. They need more caffeine. Um, but the pulmonary artery is the only artery in the body that carries deoxygenated blood away from the heart. It's coming out of the right ventricle from the deoxygenated blood. And the pulmonary artery takes that blood, deoxygenated blood, from the right ventricle to the lungs. And that inside the lungs goes all the way down to that one red blood cell at the time. The alveoli exchanges the carbon dioxide and it gets oxygen. Then it goes from the lungs. It takes the pulmonary vein from the lungs to the left atrium. The pulmonary vein is the only vein in the body that carries oxygenated blood. Every other vein carries deoxygenated blood. Goes to the left atrium. Once it gets to the left atrium, it goes to the mitral valve. Mitral valve goes to the left ventricle, which is the biggest chamber of the heart because it's got the biggest job. It's got to pump the blood back out to every cell in the body. So it goes through the aortic valve to the aorta and sends all that oxygenated blood back to the cells. And the process starts all over. You are expected to know that process. Any questions? Yes. No, the oxygen. Every other artery comes off the aorta and carries oxygen. There will also be a question of which is the first arteries that break off the aorta? It's the coronary arteries. 
the heart gives oxygen blood to the heart first. It takes the first taste of oxygenated blood for itself. <laughs> Exactly. Veins always take blood to the heart. Arteries always take blood away from the heart. Arteries are also muscular. can expand and contract based on the need of blood supply to the body. Whereas in veins, it's strictly a return system. It's a drain system. That makes sense. How are the arteries going to contract? Because it depends on, it's part of that fight or flight process. And depending on how much oxygen nutrients the cells need, it can contract to increase blood pressure and pressure to get more oxygen and nutrients, or it can dilate to relieve pressure when you're resting and you don't. And we'll go into a lot more detail on that later when we get cardiac emergency stuff. Because we have medications that you can assist your patient with to artificially dilate the arteries and get more blood flow. Even though normally constriction gives you more blood flows, cardiac emergencies, due to calcium blockage, you have to dilate to get more blood. We'll get into that later. This is not the time for that. And then there's the those are the coronary arteries. The first ones that come off the aorta reproduces the entire heart. Here's a great video on the whole thing. What? Uh -oh. I just told them everything was working great. What's wrong? Right, Ralph. Well. No idea. I just told him, oh, everything's working great, man. Good job. Go back to that little volume thing in the bottom right. Step. Yeah, and then you should be able to click that those words above the bar uh -huh. and change what where the audio is coming from. Ma'am. Really? I'm good here. <laughs> that works, I'm like. Choose your output device. Uh, uh, nope. Nothing else. Only got the one. Great. Oh, they're disabled. That's why. An easy way to remember that is that they both start with the letter A. So going to our big diagram now, we can see that blood coming in this way and yeah, but it should be that. this way is ending up at the same spot. It's going to end up at the same spot. We don't want that. Oh, this If the chamber that the blood ends up in. Well, all right. Do you guys hear that? Let's start over. What you're looking at is one of the most amazing organs in your body. This is the human heart, and it's shown with uh, all the vessels on it, and you can see the vessels coming into it and out of it. But the heart at its core is a pump, and this pump is, is why we call it the hardest working uh, organ in our body, because it starts pumping blood to the point where you're a little fetus, maybe about eight weeks old, all the way until the point where you die. And so this organ, I think it'd be really cool to look at in a little bit more detail, but it's hard to do that looking just at the outside. So what I did is I actually drew uh, what it might look like on the inside. So maybe I can just draw, show you that now. And we'll follow the path of blood through the heart using this diagram. 
let me start with, with a little uh, picture in the corner. So let's say we have a person here. This is their face, this is their neck, and draw their arms. And they have in the middle of their chest, their heart. And so the whole goal is to make sure that blood from all parts of the body, including their legs, can make its way back to the heart, first of all, and then get pumped back out to the body. So blood is going to come up from this arm, let's say, down into there, and the same on this side. And it's going to come from their head. And all three sources, the two arms and the head, are going to come together into one big vein. And that's going to be dumping into the top of the heart. And then separately, you've got veins from the legs, meeting up with veins from the belly, coming into another opening into the heart. So that's how the blood gets back to the heart. And anytime I mention the word vein, I just want you to make sure you think of blood going towards the heart. Towards the heart. Now, if blood is going towards the heart, then after the blood is pumped by the heart, it's going to have to go out to the heart, right? It's going to have to go away from the heart. So that's the aorta. And the aorta actually has a little arch like that. We call it the aortic arch. And it sends off one vessel to the arm, one vessel up this way, a vessel over this way, and then this arch kind of goes down, 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 and splits like that. So this is kind of a simplified version of it. But you can see how there are definitely some parallels between how the veins and the arteries are set up. And arteries, so anytime I mention the word artery, I want you to think of like going away from the heart. An easy way to remember that is that they both start with the letter A. So going to our big diagram now, we can see that blood coming in this way and blood coming in this way is ending up at the same spot. It's going to end up at the, actually maybe I'll draw it here, is ending up at the right atrium. Right atrium. That's just the name of the chamber that the blood ends up in. And it came into the right atrium from a giant vessel up top called the superior vena cava. And this is a vein, of course, because it's bringing blood towards the heart. And down here is an inferior vena cava. Inferior vena cava. So these are the two directions that blood is going to be flowing. And once blood is in the right atrium, it's going to head down into the right ventricle. So this is the right ventricle. Down here. This is the second chamber of the heart. And it gets there by passing through a valve. And this valve and all valves in the heart are basically there to keep blood moving in the right direction. So it doesn't go in the backwards direction. So this valve is called the tricuspid valve. Tricuspid valve. And it's called that because it's basically got three little flaps. That's why they call it tri. And I know you can only see two in my drawing, and that's um, that's just because my drawing is not perfect. And it's hard to show kind of a flap coming out of here, but you can imagine it. So blood goes into the right ventricle, and where does it go next? Well, after that, it's going to go this way. It's going to go into this vessel, and it's going to split. But before it goes there, it has to pass through another valve. So this is a valve right here called a pulmonary valve. Pulmonary valve. And it gives you a clue as to where things are going to go next, right? Because the word pulmonary means lungs. And so if this is my lung on this side, this is my left lung, and this is my right lung on this side, then these vessels, and I'll let you try to guess what they would be called, these vessels, this would be my, uh, make sure I get my right and left uh, straight, this is my left pulmonary. Artery, and I hesitated there just to make sure you got that because it's taking blood away from the heart. And this is my right pulmonary, pulmonary artery. So this is my right and left pulmonary artery. And so blood goes now into my lungs, right? These are the lungs that are kind of nestled into my thorax where my heart is sitting. Goes into my lungs. And remember, this blood is blue. Why is it blue? Well, it's blue because it doesn't have very much oxygen. And so one thing that I need to pick up is oxygen. And so that's one thing that the lungs are going to help me pick up, and I'm going to write O2 for oxygen. And it's also blue, and that reminds us that it's full of carbon dioxide. It's full of waste. 
because it's coming from the body, right? The body's made a lot of carbon dioxide that it's trying to get rid of. So in the lungs, you get rid of your carbon dioxide and you pick up oxygen. So that's why I switch at this point from a blue colored vessel to a red colored vessel. So now blood comes back in this way, in this way, and dumps into this chamber. So what is that? This is our left atrium, our left atrium. And just like our right atrium, we have one on the left. And it goes down into, and you can probably guess what this one is called. It's our left ventricle. So just like before, where it went from the right atrium to the right ventricle, now we're going from the left atrium to the left ventricle. And it passes through a valve here, right? So this valve is called the mitral valve. Mitral valve. And its job is, of course, to make sure that blood does not go from the left ventricle back to the left atrium. <coughs> it wants to make sure that there's forward flow. And then the final valve, and I have to find a nice spot to write it, maybe right here. This final valve that it passes through is called the aortic valve. Aortic valve. And the aortic valve is going to be what divides the left ventricle from this giant vessel that we talked about earlier. And this is, of course, the aorta. This is my aorta. So now blood is going to go through the aorta to the rest of the body. So you can see how blood now flows from the body into the four chambers. First into the right atrium, this is chamber number one. And then it goes into the right ventricle, this is chamber number two. It goes to the lungs and then back out to the left atrium. So this is chamber number three, and then the left ventricle. And this happens every moment of every day. Every time you hear your heart beating, this process is going on. Any questions? We'll go over the electrical system of the heart when we do cardiac emergencies. It's pretty cool to learn. I'm not going to have you bogged down your brain with it right now. You need to be familiar with the average heart rates of adults, children, and infants. Yeah, these are your average rates. Anything under 60 adults, bradycardia, anything 100 or over is called tachycardia. Now, with kids, yeah, depending on their age and their size, they can be over 70 to 150 beats a minute. And babies, they just go around like a steam driver freight train, 100 to 160 high speed rail. Any questions? Tachycardia. No, once you get to about 15, 16, 60 to 100 is the average the rest of your life. Because you don't grow much more in size. Your size is generally about the same. All right, you need to know your major arteries and your major veins. Your major arteries are your aortic artery, your pulmonary artery, your carotid, femoral, and brachial. Your veins are your vena cavas, your pulmonary, and that's really all you need to know, your femoral. Any questions on arteries and veins? What's that? Radial is right by your thumb. Rather right than radius bone, think radial bone, radial artery. 
Then the big doors. The rig heel's up here, where right? the crook of your elbow all the way up. Okay. So in adults, you feel for the brake heel right here because you have cartilage. But in children, you got to press the brake heel up against the humerus. That's actually a better spot in little, little kids than the carotid. Because the carotid, there's no cartilage there. It's just soft tissue. So there's nothing to push the artery up against the feel of pulse. Any questions? Yeah, so one's a pulmonary artery, one's a pulmonary vein. Oh. But radial shouldn't be under veins. Radial is an artery. It should be femoral. I screwed that up. It's a femoral vein? Yeah, you have a femoral vein and a femoral artery. They're right through the pelvis and right down your legs. Right past your femurs. This is the radial artery? Yeah, radial is an artery, not a vein. That's why I said I screwed that up. Oh. I put it in there to try to get you to do You did a good job. Huh? You didn't know the radial artery. All right, this will be on the test, the four components of blood. Plasma, which is the fluid. Red blood cells, which carry oxygen nutrients. White blood cells, which fight infections and viruses. And then platelets, which are your repair team that come and repair your vessels when they're damaged. Four components of blood. Platelets, yeah. Think of plates in an outlet mall, platelets. Fluid, yeah. Questions? Hang in there. Only got 30 minutes left. All right, so pulse. Pulse, again, is when you're pressing an artery up against a rigid surface. So you can feel the wave of blood coming through when the aortic valve opens up and expels the blood from the left ventricle. So you can't feel a pulse if you're pressing it against soft tissue. So it's got to be an area close to the skin by a rigid surface. Your carotid's got the cartilage right there. Your radial's got the radial bone right there. Your brachial's got the cartilage right there. Your femoral's got the femoral bone right there. But in babies and kids, the brachial and the femoral are the only ones that are close to the surface that press up against something rigid. Because they don't have cartilage as the adults yet. Any questions? All right, blood pressure. So your systolic, the top number we hear on our blood pressure, that is the pressure against the artery walls when the left ventricle contracts. The diastolic is when left ventricle relaxes. Kind of like flow and static pressure for anyone that's on fire. Kind of, not really. Perfusion is a vocabulary word you have to know. That is circulation of blood to all tissues. And then the term hypoperfusion would be what? Black up. And hypoperfusion is what shock is. 
pull over that for shot. Oh, actually, it says right there in the last four. If an adequate or hypoperfusion, the patient will go into shock. Any questions? Any questions? What's that? Hyperfusion would be high blood pressure. That's what I have. All right, your nervous system. This will also be the test. You got to know the difference between your somatic and your autonomic. The somatic is what regulates your voluntary action. Raise your hand. That's your somatic nervous system. Your autonomic nervous system breaks into two different parts, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. The sympathetic is what gives you your fight or flight response. Your parasympathetic does all your vegetation functions, digestion, heart rate control, respiratory control, renal system, et cetera. Remember, somatic is voluntary actions. Autonomic is all involuntary reactions. Autonomic breaks into two systems, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Sympathetic is fight or flight. Parasympathetic is all your vegetative functions. Any questions? All right, your central nervous system is your brain and spinal cord. All the nerves that come off of your central nervous system, off your spinal cord, are called your peripheral nervous system. Your central nervous system consists of the cere cerebellum, the cerebrium, the brain stem, and the spinal cord. <coughs> Unless you're an alligator, we don't have any wild animals. You don't have to write that down. But... Yeah, it's from the water. Adam Sandler. Mom, mom said, "Algiers don't have no real avocado." 
They got all they need. <laughs> exactly. No furniture. All right, there's a good picture of your central and peripheral nervous system. Any questions? Peripheral nervous system breaks into two parts, sensory nerves and motor nerves. Sensory nerves is how you sensation, how you feel things. Motor nerves take the directions and move the muscles with the joints and bones. Then you have what's called arc reflexes. So in case you do something really stupid, like stick your head into a fire, or touch a hot pot, it automatically recoils. What's that? Probably, yeah, you'll automatically pull back. That's an arc reflex. Also, the doctor takes a little hammer and hammers your spots to make sure your reflexes are working. Oh, what happened? I wish I had a good picture of somebody sticking their hand into a candle. So your sensory nerves are mostly in your skin. That's all part of your somatic nervous system. Your skin is a very important organ. It's the largest organ in your body. Protects you from bacteria and viruses. Regulates body temperature with vasoconstriction and vasodilation. And transmits the information to the brain from the sensory nerves. Questions? That's what your skin looks like. You're to shave it off. Under a microscope. From the environment, what is protected from is like bacteria, viruses, things like that. Oh, yeah. But it's like 99.9%. Yeah. Kind of like I'll never forget in, uh, 1981, which was a long time ago. But I was still alive. Um, they had a structure fire in the MGM Hotel in Las Vegas, and 81 people died. And uh, yeah, it was a bad structure fire. But I'll never forget the Las Vegas fire chief came on for a press conference. And they said, What is it? You know, you guys were not able to rescue 81 people. And he said, I'll never forget this. He said, There was 10,000 people in that building when we got there. We got 9,000. 919 people out. We rescued 9,919 people. Over 99.5% of the people in the building were rescued. You're dwelling on the 0.5% that we couldn't get to. So your skin lights up 99.9%, but yeah, every once in a while, you're going to get sick. And you go as well, it's a combination of your skin and immune system. Something does get the skin, 99% of that gets killed by the immune system. Unless it's something so important, it goes, what's there? And then it goes, bam, kick your immune system. But any questions about the skin? All right, the endocrine system. This is really complicated stuff that I will not try to. Uh, there's seven glands that release all kinds of hormones, and it's extremely complicated. The one you guys need to learn the most about is insulin coming from the pancreas. That's the most important part of the endocrine system for AMTs. And we'll go, we've got a whole chapter dedicated to just that. And we'll do that after midterm. Any questions? Those are the endocrine glands. The pancreas is the most important one for EMTs. The adrenal glands are you need to know about too, though, because that's what gives you your fight or flight. Pituitary is how you grow. Ovaries and testes are for reproduction. Thyroid is for body regulation, and so is the parathyroid. Any questions?
There's the digestive system from the beginning to the end. Food and water goes into the mouth, gets broken down by the salivatory glands, through the oropharynx, down the esophagus, into the stomach. The pancreas and the liver release digestive enzymes to help break down the food. And that's delivered through the bile ducts, and then the food dumps into the small intestine where it takes nutrients and fluid out. Then it takes the waste to the large intestine. Your appendix gets rid of any toxins, toxins in there, and then it's pooped out through the rectum. There's the blood notes in the digestive system. Any questions? Appendix pretty much filters it all out. So yeah, it gets rid of the toxins and poisons. So I think because we never use the orcs, our food is so regulated. We don't ever eat, you know, rotted meat or anymore. So that's why people get. Yeah, cut out. It's no big deal. Questions. Yeah, if we were to go back to further the time, you definitely need your appendix. Eat raw meat loaded with bacteria. Spray the maggots and the wipe the maggots and the bugs off and take a guy to the raw meat. You still need your appendix for that. When you go to the store and buy something from process and tax two thousand times, you're probably gonna be okay. Just get cancer in the end. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you never know. It might be like the backup quarterback who's eager to get a chance to play. <laughs> but it could be that it's out of practice, too. Put the first ball into the stands. Then we got the urinary system. So a good test question. The kidneys are not in any of the abdominal quadrants. They lie behind the abdominal sac, what's called the retroperitoneal space. So retro is behind, peritoneum is the sac that holds all your abdominal organs in it. Layman's term is gut sac. And uh, the kidneys sit behind it, so it's the retroperitoneal space. Yeah. Sounds kind of cool. That's where pee comes from. That's where it generates, and then it goes down your uterus to your bladders, and the bladder is a storage thing. The bladder gets full, then you pee it out. Yeah. Sorry, retro What's that? Retro what? Retro peritoneal. Peritoneum is the sac that holds all your abdominal organs in it. It's behind it, so it's a retro peritoneal space. Oh, yeah, it's right there on the surface. Yeah. Kidneys are exposed because they're below the posterior rib cage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I was sitting too when you get tackled from behind someone hits you in the helmet, uh, right in the lower back, but the mid back, you do a hell of a shot to the kidney. Then there's the male reproductive system. You should have gotten that in eighth grade. Pictures. <laughs> and the female reproductive system. <laughs> the pictures. Don't want that misinterpreted. All right, questions. How much blood is in an adult body, the average adult body? How many liters? I got 72, I got six. That's a big difference. How about seven? How about five? How about four? How about six? Seven. Somebody said seven. six? Seven. I think it's six. Well, what do I know? Two of us got it right. So the bronchus divides into smaller bronchioles, and the ends of those passages terminate and form the what? Is it the Alveoli or the bronchi? Which one's the better answer? Alveoli. Of uh, the capillaries. It's not the capillaries. It's true, but it's on the wrong end. That's on the vascular side, not the pulmonary side. How about the pleura? Not a bad answer, but it has nothing to do with the end distal end of below the bronchioli. So the only right answer could be 
Raviolis. Raviolis. <laughs> You're at the scene of a CPR in progress. The patient's family states they have a do not resuscitate order on file at the patient's private doctor's office. They would like you to stop CPR. What should you do? They all have comments. You got to keep going. Contact based hospital for direction. Not a bad answer. Can you CPR and transport? Yeah. If they don't have it in hand, it's not valid. Stop CPR. I know that's the wrong answer. I'm not sure about A or B. They're all pretty good answers. Ask is DR, it doesn't matter if DR a little bit So between A and B, which one's the best answer? It's going to be B. <laughs> the end. All right, you guys got 15 minutes. Be back here at 8 o'clock, ready to learn about skills. Yeah, that's the shirt on the back. Is that from once you get that? Is that what the deal is? Yeah, that after that, so show up every day. Shirt on the back. No problem. 